Labdien, good afternoon and welcome back to the plenary session of the Council of European Greens here in uh, Riga. I see that some of you have survived this early afternoon working sessions uh, that we had on the future of Europe, on campaigning and on energy policy. And I hope you have shared your thoughts, impressions and snapshots of, the, of this event on social media using the special hashtag um, EGP35. But now we have come to an, I would say, ever increasingly important, uh, urgent or even existential topic of building the green future. The Greens are very well known for being able to drive climate policies, the green transition, to clean, uh, the fight for clean energy, for sustainable transport and to protect biodiversity. And this is one side of the coin and the other side of the coin is social. It has a human face. Because tackling climate change also implies and requires tackling social and economic injustice. It also in it requires ensuring well-being to all. And there are many different pieces of this puzzle to be put together. And I have high expectations for the panel of so many capable speakers that are forthcoming now to put these pieces together to make it a reality. So this session will be dedicated to the question of how to ensure a just transition towards sustainable, resilient, uh, fair future. And I have the honor of asking to the stage uh, the capable moderators for this session, Vula Tsetsi and Jean Lambert. Please, the stage is yours. So, dear, um, dear friends, uh, good afternoon. I, I'm really extremely pleased uh, to chair with uh, Green this session after all these days of discussions among us, because I think that uh, this session is the session of uh, the future, but also of the present. Uh, when we are talking about a green, just transition, is exactly the core of our policies and I'm very pleased to see that uh, we are talking about green but also we are talking about just because indeed this transition can be effective if it is in the right direction so in the greening of, uh, of our, um, our planet but also of the way we are living but also when it is equally for equal for everyone and is not leaving nobody behind because as it has been mentioned this morning also by commissioner sinkevichus if uh, this transition will not be just we will not be able to take with us the citizens uh, the people and that they need to gain trust in this transition in order to create the mobilization and in order to have a result. And therefore, I really think that this plenary is in the core of uh, the beginning of our campaign for the next two years, because we have to be able not only to show that we are in governments, not only to show that we have a project, not only to show that we can communicate this project in a way that everybody understands it, but also that we have the allies, we have the strategy, we have the messages, we have the capacity to create these dynamics when they can create this transition. And I will not repeat what it has been discussed so long these days, all the consequences of the war, of the COVID, uh, all the, um, the beginning of a series of crises after crisis, we will have even more because we did not yet face all the consequences of the current crisis. So the question that it will be so nice and we will discuss together is, it is still possible to go for a green, just transition it is a real possibility, there is a real possibility to manage how, with which allies, what are the difficulties in government when we are in member states and we have to govern in coalitions that they are not 
always the easiest and what also they are the, um, uh, the dynamics at an institutional level, but also what are the dynamics in the civil society together with uh, trade unions, with movements, with businesses, because of course we will need all this together in order to make it happen. And uh, it is not only how we will gain trust, which is so important in politics, but for us, it is also how to fight populism. I found very relevant what the commissioner said this morning, that if we are able really to give the answers, we will be able to fight populism and extreme right parties, which they grow, unfortunately, more and more in Europe because people, they don't see the light at the end of the channel. So, I would like uh, to present uh, the very, very special guests with uh, uh, starting from uh, um, Ricarda Lang, which is the co-chair of uh, the German Greens. This is the first moment, the first moment. <laughs> This is the first time we meet here in her new functions as a co-chair and a key player of the biggest party we have, not only in terms of number, but also in terms of impact. So, Ricarda, there is a lot of expectations when it comes to you, but I must also say that there is so much insurance and, uh, and we are so happy because we know your past as feminists, so close to the social issues, a big fighter, so that already before we start the discussion reassures us quite a lot. Then I have uh, the big pleasure to present you Abu Bakar Sumahoro. Uh, he is... Uh, <laughs> A social activist and trade unionist uh, from Cote d'Ivoire, but he's living in Italy. And uh, he is uh, uh, somebody that he's very well known uh, for all his fights linked to uh, the migrants' rights and the social rights. So uh, we will have the pleasure to debate with you. Then uh, I would like to present you uh, Sophie Punte. Welcome. Managing Director of Policy at the Women Business Coalition. So very pleased to have you with us in this setting. Uh, then, uh, uh, last but not least, Caspar uh, Briskens. I hope I am not too many. <laughs> I'm fine. Is the member of the Expert Forum of Progressive, and uh, he is also <laughs> the lead uh, candidate for uh, uh, the progressive in the upcoming national elections. So who knows, maybe also the future prime minister in this country. So very, very pleased <laughs> to meet you. And again, the last one, uh, which is uh, very close also to my heart in the European Parliament, Ernest Urtasun, member <laughs> Vice President of our group, uh, he follows very important committees and he is somebody who really brings the voice of the South and not only in a group which, uh, let's say, it's also needed that. So very pleased to have you uh, with us. So myself, I'm Vula Tsetsi, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm the Secretary General of the Greens in the European Parliament and also until tonight, member of the committee, and I'm really pleased to, to have you all. Uh, so I take the seat, <laughs> and I would like maybe to start uh, immediately uh, the uh, questions uh, with, uh, uh, with you, Ricarda, because, of course, as uh, I have mentioned in, uh, in our presentations, uh, I mean, you are a leading voice when it comes to the social justice, and uh, you are uh, so much uh, uh, committed in this, uh, in this agenda in difficult political times uh, with um, 
complicated coalition, so we would like uh, from you to give us a little bit your vision about the projects that we have promoted in Germany uh, on the social uh, aspect and uh, the social justice. Yes, thank you. Is it on? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, first of all. I'm very happy to be here. I think the last time I was as a EGP council was when it was in Berlin and we were still in the opposition and so much has changed since then and our responsibilities have become bigger. And of course, this is happening in a situation that I would not have expected. I became party leader in January and I still became party leader in the atmosphere of after 16 years of being in the opposition, we can finally put the things we have been saying in Parliament speeches and written down in position papers, we can finally put them into reality and also we formed something we called a coalition of progress. So while there was so much being held back of societal progress with the last 16 years of conservative chancellorship, there was really a chance of changing something. And then the war came and suddenly everything changed for us and we were talking about things that I would not have expected, giving weapons to Ukraine and how we act when the, there's a war on European, on a European in, in Europe. And for many things, this has changed our role within the government. I think it has it maybe made it more important. It has put new responsibility on our shoulders. But I'm very convinced that this core project we have as a green movement, as a green family, the just transition, it has only made this more important than what we see now at the moment is that for many, many years, for many decades, we as Germany, we as Europe, have been kind of externalizing the prices of how we produce goods, how we produce wealth and how our economy works. For example, there has never been cheap Russian gas. There was always a price for Russian gas, and now the people in Ukraine are paying this price. And there are no cheap fossil fuels. Fossil fuels always have a price, and the future generations, the children, but also people in the global south nowadays, are paying this price. So I think what is our big like challenge within the government, but also within the whole of Europe, is to find a way where economy works without externalizing our prices, where our wealth is not built of the exploitation of big part of the world and also of future generations, and where it is not built on the dependency of authoritarian regimes, not built on the um, dependency of dictators like Putin, so it's about independence. And this independence is also a social issue. Because what we see right now, and I think this was really interesting, we just did not just have national elections last year, but we had elections in our biggest federal state, North Rhine-Westphalia, just a few weeks ago. I see Pega here, she's our international secretary from North Rhine-Westphalia. And I think what was interesting there was when you were looking at it from like an a typical how you would see the Greens as aspect. I think everything was staked against us. We were in a war situation and the subject that was most important for people when going voting was inflation, was the prices getting higher. And normally this would be a situation where you would think Greens are losing because when the prices go up, people feel like, oh, now we need to be more secure, not so much change. But what has really changed is that so many people understand that what we're experiencing at the moment is a fossil inflation. The dependency on fossil fuels is getting the prices to go up. So I think getting independent of this, and we want to have 100% renewable energies until 2035, is not only an issue of climate protection, but also an issue of social justice, because only renewable energies will give us stable prices. And therefore, I think now we have the chance, and we really need to take this chance, to get away from this weird notion of social justice and climate protection being contradictory to each other, being something which goes against each other, because the climate protection is a social issue. And I have been, when we were in the opposition, for many years, I have been really angry that especially those parties, in Germany it was the Conservatives and the Liberals, that were voting against higher minimum wages, that were voting against child guarantee payments, 
that these parties were discovering their heart for poor people, for low-income families, when it would go against climate protection. And I think that people with a low income, also the people who work in the coal industry, they have deserve more than just being an excuse for others not to do climate protection. And therefore, we now can see that social justice and climate protection are not contradictory, but they're two things of the same, two things of a just future. Then I would like to continue again with you, Ricarda. Maybe you could present us one or two proposals that you put forward on the social domain. I know that you have been very active fighting uh, the children's uh, poverty. Uh, so could you maybe develop a little bit more this uh, social agenda link, of course, with the mm -hmm. ecological transition? Yeah, sure. I think one thing we have been doing is that yesterday, I know there was a lot of talk about the German government doing the Sondervermögen and doing this budget on military, but what kind of went under the surface, which I think is really sad, is that yesterday the German parliament also raised the minimum wage to 12 euros, something we have been proposing for a long time, because I think it's clear, I also think we need a European minimum wage, because it's clear that people who work should be able to live from their work, and it needs to get higher. A second thing we did is, like you said, the child guarantee, it's called Kindergrundsicherung, and that was one of my main successes when we were in the coalition talks because I myself was raised by a mother who was alone and she was working in the social system actually in like houses that women who experienced violence can go to, we call it Frauenhaus. And when I was 18, she lost her job because the um, financing for this project were cut. And so this had to need to be closed down and she lost her job. And this was actually the moment I got into politics because I felt like, well, this is not right. This cannot be right that especially in those parts of our society, we, we cut the spending. And then when I was doing the coalition talks and there we have the child guarantee, which is a promise for so many single parents to make their life a little bit easier, which is a promise for millions of children to get out of child poverty, I really felt like, well, politics can change something. We can change something if we only want to. And this, for me, was one of the biggest successes and still, the, yeah, what really makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe one last example of what we are doing now, and I think this can really be an example of, like you said, how to put climate politics, ecological politics and social politics together. We were, had a big Entlastungspaket, we call it. It was like a social package reaction to the high prices. And there's a lot of things in there, better payments for workers, better um, support for low-income uh, low families. But I think what it really was like a special project is the so-called 9 euro ticket, 9 euro ticket. And this means that in the whole of Germany, everybody can use public transfer, trans, uh, transport for nine euros per month. And I think this is really good because it supports people using trains and buses, which often, especially in bigger cities, are people who are low income. And it also gives people an incentive to say, well, I switch from my car to public transport and we have it for three months now. And my goal is to make something like this permanent because we can really show how social and ecological politics work together. <laughs> but Yes, um, I mean, I, you see, some people, they can say it is possible to do it because Germany has the investments and the possibility to do it. Uh, but uh, at the same moment, I think that, um, I mean, what are you doing also going, goes uh, much more also on a dynamic on creating new uh, partnerships and become a trustful partner, political partner with uh, an electorate which is much let's say, larger than the traditional one. Before I leave you in peace, I would like to understand a little bit more the strategy around 
your partners in, uh, in uh, how you managed to enlarge this trust uh, on, uh, on your political project, on our political project? Well, I think we have coined like this frame throughout the last year, which is called Bündnispartei, and it means something like coalition party. Um, I myself and I think many people within our party really come from like a movement and also an activist background. So we always knew that politics don't just take place within the parliament. But I think what we have done within the last years is to widen this aspect and to say, well, it's the social movements and they are one important pillar, but maybe we also as a party can be a link from different parts of society. So to get the social movements and the unions and a part of economy that is actually really investing in a better future to get them together and to have like a coalition, not just within a government with different parties, but really a coalition within the whole of society. And to do this, what we had to show and what I hope we are showing now within the government is that we are not a single issue party and no Green Party. None of you are single issue parties. We are the party for climate protection and ecological change, but we are also party of social justice. We are party of civil rights. We are party of, um, uh, I don't know, like a better economy and stuff like this. And I think this to really show that we call it something like fault sortiment and to gain the trust of people now. And I think what we can show at the moment and what really makes people trust in us is that on the one hand, when the Greens are in government, it works. <laughs> it sounds really basic, but things work out. And that on the one hand, we can be pragmatic in the present, also take steps that are not easy for us, take steps that are really, really hard for us, because in the end, we don't do politics for our program and just to like clap us on the shoulder, but we do politics for the reality. But that being pragmatic in the present does not have to mean to give up a vision and to give up a goal. And I think we really show this within the energy segment at the moment. And we're saying, yeah, we're going difficult steps when it comes to diversificating our sources for energy. But we always do it with a clear vision and a clear plan and a goal for the future. And this goal is 100% renewable energy because it can work, we can make it work, and we can take society with us. For example, we say if a, com if like a city gets wind and energy and solar panels, they earn from it directly. So not just the big, the big companies are earning, but they can pay their new train station from the money they get from like renewable energy. So really to make it something that works for the whole of society and to make society be part of it. I think transition can never be something that only happens in parliaments. It needs to be something that happens from the union to everybody of us being part of it because in the end it's also a question of self-determination, the right to decide of our own futures. Abu Bakar, I mean, uh, the, the word just, just transition, um, it's so important for you in your fights as activists, in your, all the years you are really following the questions with the invisible people that they do not have a voice and they really need to, uh, they are part of our society, but without having power to act and to change things. So I will be really grateful if uh, you um, explain to us a little bit your experience and understand also your expectations at this specific moment, what you believe that it should be done, that these invisible people uh, are really come out from the precarity, but also uh, they have a voice in our society. I'm going to answer in French. I can see everybody to put in their headphones. I see everybody putting their headphones on already. First and foremost, I would like to thank, thank all our comrades here among us today. Equally, I would like to say that when we speak about a just transition or indeed the question of social justice in this context, 
the context in which we live today, allow me to say that we live within a context that is illustrative through a crisis of values, losing points of reference. And equally, this context tells us that it has made us think that individuals are the center of the world. Everybody experiences crises from their own point of view. But based on my experience, my daily life, it looks at the social justice question to try and find a family, just in response to your question. I've met families that they cannot pay bills. The same family still cannot access internet even. So we, pose our, we asked ourselves the question, when we look at the conditions of this particular family, for example, and if we look across Europe, this family that I met in a city in Italy is the same family that we meet with the same difficulties linked to a lack of social justice, social inequalities and indeed digital inequality, the lack of ability to be able to connect to the internet. So then the question is, can we imagine thinking and imagining social justice and energy justice if we don't ask and rather question the economic paradigm which causes so much inequality. The current paradigm that we have, can we actually speak about social justice or energy justice given our paradigm? We have an eco economic model and indeed an economy based on war which, which just leads to other wars. The question, this is linked to social justice. If we look at the period between 2020, we have seen that war economy has a turnover of billions of euros. The normal economy was on the way down, though, so the, the economy of war knows no crisis. And the more crises we suffer, the more war we have, and that generates turnover. So the question is, how can we actually have proper social justice? For who? Given the uh, war of economy, the economy of war. Today, with 95 million in the EU living in poverty, given that reality, can we actually think about interpreting their need of social justice if we do not look at the real dimensions of life? their lives. If we're not able to really deal with this type of dimension, the risk is that the questions of social justice linked to energy and social justice is something that will be just for privileged people. Because people say, first of all, I have to feed my family, I have to pay my bills, I have to pay my rent. And the precariousness for young people and inequality is what remains. So the priority is, first of all, try and respond to these needs that are linked to family. And when we breathe polluted air and we have the question of dependence, dependency on the gas that we have today, people will say they're not interested. For me, I care about my family. I want my family to be able to respond to their vital needs. If we do not understand the dimension of people's desires, why should people be interested in a political movement that has the question of 
climate justice at its core. If this climate justice is not properly within proper social justice. We need to make people understand that what we're trying to do is for them, is for their families, is for their future. That's the question we have to look at today. I think that's the best way, really, to interpret the needs that are linked to social justice, that are also linked to safeguarding our planet. There's no other planet, and we can't interpret climate justice or environmental justice if we don't question the current paradigm that prevails. We cannot cure an allergy with a plant that causes an allergic reaction. I completely share your view. Uh, but I would like to ask you, um, taking the example uh, in Italy, I mean, uh, or some other examples that you know, that in order to create this um, new dimension, this new dynamic, this social and ecological justice, uh, you need um, forces and movements which they will go against the current political context because we know that the traditional parties, they have produced what we face to, together today. And therefore, um, it is impo in very important to be able to mobilize people which goes to this direction, not only the 80, 86 million that you are talking, but also the rest of the society and the partners, find partners in order to push the political system to be able to react and to give also the possibility of real alternatives and not uh, uh, a situation where people with the lack of alternatives, they turn to the extremes uh, because also this is something we see more and more all over Europe and you leave it every day in Italy because if tomorrow there will be elections, Meloni with Salvini, they will take over the country and we saw also happening in France, a country which you know quite well with, uh, uh, with Le Pen and Zemmour. And um, therefore my question to you is to understand a little bit this mobilization, how you see it from your perspective, because you are very active and very, very important activists, what is practically the dynamic around of that, how we can change things? Alors, moi, je pense que, Think. Supposons que let's imagine il y a une that there, we have que nous dans un a context where we have rain, Et la pluie, qui tombe, and the water falls upon us, and it makes us try and find refuge pour pouvoir, to be able to look after ourselves, given the heavy downfall of water. Here we're speaking of poverty. The rain is poverty, job precarious, uh, insecurity, exploitation, it's discrimination among people. Equally, that rain represents all people whom have to work 12-hour days, day after day, for low wages. They need protection to be able to look after themselves. And the only umbrella that could protect them they are supposed to be able to be protected by that umbrella. For us, we have a goal, and that's to allow those people to be able to take shelter under a different umbrella, an umbrella that is not encompassing discrimination against people or sexual orientation or the color of your skin or stig or any type of stig 
stigma links to those who are what we call different. We cannot judge people who are trying to shelter themselves. What we could do would be to try and have a red line, a red line that is anti-fascism, a red line of every type of fight against discrimination. Equally, though, we should allow these people to be able to speak about their conditions of poverty, their conditions of invisibility. But we need to be able to do this in a strategic manner, a united strategy. That's why I say we need to be able to federate those who are invisible based on their needs. We need to be able to bring them together in a society that is based on strong values of solidarity, equality, participation, but equally, keep in mind the idea of the reality of our interdependent world. We cannot think about tackling the question of, let's say, hunger. 111 million people suffer hunger. We're now hearing the UN say that there's a risk of a famine hurricane. And that's why the president of the AU met Putin and he said he wanted to remove hurdles so that wheat could arrive in Africa. So what do we need to try and do? We need to try and allow for people to federate under the within values of peace based on solidarity that can go beyond borders, beyond the European borders that we have. That will allow for us to create a proper union, a federation of invisibles whom could interpret a different type of dimension of policy, policy that could allow for hope to be able to tell people that it's possible, it's possible to realize your dreams. If policy does not create that reality, this ability, then we run the risk of limiting ourselves to those who are maintaining the elevator. The elevator is not working. We need to be able to allegorically ensure that we have a different horizon, create hope and transform hope into reality. We need to come together. We need, need to be able to go beyond discourse because it's easy to decry the umbrella that I mentioned earlier, the racist umbrella. People, nevertheless, need shelter. Could we have a different umbrella with proper equality of opportunity, with no discrimination, where we stop looking at poor people as if they were repugnant people on earth? No, we need to have a proper dream, a European dream, with a different type of dimension of Europe in our mind. That should allow for us to really create a space of humanity, being able to say that our planet is not just for human beings, but rather living beings. Et avant de passer la modération à Jean, uh, je, je voudrais porter mon expérience directe avec toi. My direct parce que quand experience connu, with you. When we met one each other, you said to me immediately that the vision of social justice is extremely linked to ecology. And just like you say, explain it now that it is really not possible to. To, to disconnect the two, the ecology with uh, the, uh, the social justice. Uh, so um, I know that uh, you have worked uh, extremely hard to uh, reform uh, the common agriculture policy. You are one of these uh, persons that denounced very, very, uh, very much publicly uh, all 
all the bad results, the limits of, uh, of what it has been voted with the reform of the common agriculture policy. We know that if we want to have a just transition, uh, they, as we explained before, uh, Ricarda said before, it's um, much more than the climate, is, uh, is mobility, is uh, the social dimension, is health, is uh, a lot of other issues. It's also agriculture. So maybe before I conclude my questions with you, could you just bring us a little bit more on, 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 on your vision and fights when it comes to the reform of a sustainable agriculture uh, policy. Je pense qu'aujourd'hui, tout ce qu'on mange, everything that we eat, tout ce qu'on consomme, everything that we consume, répond à une logique. Is linked to a logic. Manger, c'est de la politique. Eating is politics. Consumption is politics, even if we don't get to decide those politics. The air that we breathe today should, be, should allow for us to pose this following question. When we consume an agricultural product, we need to ask ourselves, where does it come from? Every day, I work, I work in my activist role with farmers, with peasants, whom, given the cap that was adopted recently, say that it's a series of policy that does not allow for us to live in a dignified way. Given the work we have to do every day, there are workers who work 12 hours a day and they receive 20 euro for it. There are some people who don't even receive 20 euro. They just get a liter of oil sometimes, they get some Pasta, and it's given that reality and that, that we fight. We try and organize workers. There are some people who do not even have a place to sleep. That's the question. So if an agricultural policy does not allow for these workers or these peasants whom are living under a form of dictatorship given large-scale retail and distribution. I don't think it's a type of agricultural policy that responds to our needs. Given the current crisis, we say that we understand what's being adopted. The European Court of Auditors have said that current policy is a risk for our environment. I think we need to have a proper alliance, an alliance that is based on defending farmers, peasants, and indeed consumers too. That would allow for us to create a proper reality and ensure that our voices are heard. If we don't do that, the question of the cap will not encompass those who are within it. We are in a digital world right now, but there are people who are not involved within this digital world. Just like I said, what we eat is politics, but we need to ask ourselves, what we're eating, is it ethically viable? When we see that people are being exploited, it's not ethically sound. I think we should ensure that we understand what we eat. So we have an identity linked to what we eat. That's the challenge that we have. But that's also linked to the question of the environment. We cannot produce while destroying nature, polluting the air. We also have to think about the health of those who are on the field. That's why we have this complex question. I will finish up by saying that we, there's no more time left to 
just speak, pay lip service. We need to imagine, because without imagination, we cannot have a perspective of a better world, because we say that people say we need to accept our world. No, we need to play a better role, a revolutionary role a spiritual role to say that we can change the cap. We need to dare, we need to dare to ensure that the invisible people can say, yes, what we produce is for human prosperity, pro prosperity, but for living beings' prosperity too, above all. Thank you. Okay, then uh, we'll move on and it, uh, in, as part of this transition in the panel, I also want to do an advert for the excellent book from the Green European Foundation entitled A European Just Transition for a Better World. So there are copies available and we have one for each of our speakers as part of a thank you for being here. So that's the commercial, the non-commercial break when we move to Sophie comes from a, a, a different, um, I suppose, sort of perspective, different daily life in this from what we've just been hearing from Abu Bakr, but has, you've got, had a very long history in working with, with business in trying to make it move and, and what might actually work there. And I was looking online, you know, you, we troll our, not quite that, we research our speakers. And one of the things you've done had spoken about the potential of the European Union to lead in terms of action on climate change and just transition. And in that way to inspire companies to do more, not only in the European Union, but other countries throughout the world, because this is a global issue, it's not just about Europe through, for example, increasing investment or decarbonizing the value chain and decent jobs so that people are not working 12 hours for 20 euro. But why is it that companies actually need to see EU leadership in this? Why is it that companies can't just do it themselves? You, you know, what is the added value, as it were, of European Union leadership on this? Thank you for that question. Um, just to clarify, when, for many of you who don't know, we mean business coalition. We're a coalition of seven business networks and many uh, partners around, the, um, around in different countries, including actually Stiftung Klimawirtschaft in Germany. And our role is to bring together companies that actually want to embrace that new economy, that social green future, and try and make their voice louder to compensate for the a little bit anti-climate lobby that we see much stronger, much well resourced. So we're, we're uh, smaller, but it's a little bit of a David versus Goliath type of movement. But we're the David, okay? So um, the, the, how, how EU can encourage a trend, I think it's important to um, paint a future where business see an opportunity. And that is, a, a, um, I would say, a future that is less framed around climate, just, climate justice and social justice, but much more around a new economy that is centered around people and, uh, people and planet. So it's the, same, it's the same argument, but it's the positioning that, that bus where businesses can understand, that they can relate to, and they feel they can contribute to. Uh, let me give an example. Um, if you were to talk about um, um, renewable energy, there's a company called Orsted from Denmark. They already transitioned from being a fossil fuel, fossil fuel company to renewable energy company. All of your countries will have companies like this that have already embraced that future and are working to it. Let their voices be heard. The alternative, of course, is to try and lobby against or find counter arguments against the companies that are trying to resist those change, but you're giving them a platform when you do that. Find those companies that are positive. So give, give those companies a voice. Um, the, the, the reason why companies need, need a government, we need clear and unambiguous government policy. Otherwise, companies can't invest. You can't say, oh, we're going to 
we're going to uh, subsidize biofuels and next year, oh, we're going to remove the subsidies for a reason. Because if companies don't have that clarity of direction, they can't invest. And what I like about the Greens, of course, is you have a very clear and unambiguous policy direction, which is green and social. So I, I do think you can help them um, by helping them build the business case. I'll give an example of where this might be needed. The steel um, sector, if we're going to move to low carbon steel, prices are, costs are going to go up by 20 to 30 percent. For chemicals, it's going to go up by 20 to 80 percent. Right? So if that is to succeed, we need research and development, we need either subsidizing the alternatives or taxing high carbon steel in order to make that happen. And without consistent uh, policies and pricing by governments, these companies are simply not going to be able to invest enough to make that transition happen. Um, another, another way that, that governments could do it is public purchasing. Did you know that about 19 to 20 percent of a country's GDP is by government spending? Are your government spending consistently in infrastructure that's built with low carbon steel, alternative for cement, thinks about recyclable material, requires a materials passport for infrastructure to be built? Because if you send that signal loud and strong, then business think, they're not just asking us to do it alone, we're getting the backing of governments that they, they also put in their words where, where their policies are. And this is that I think that collaboration where businesses and, and, and governments can help. Where we can make this possible, I want to give a final example, is um, we worked with a Stiftung Klimawirtschaft in Germany who are um, working with us on the G7 presidency hosted by, by Germany where we've identified what are the policy needs that businesses need to succeed. And we're working with a European partner called Climate Leadership Group Europe to uh, support the EU government in understanding what are the policies that would help businesses to uh, support the Repower EU package, which fits in the Fit for 55. So the things that we're asking for, invest in the energy efficiency, simple examples, if all buildings are required to have fire alarms, why are not all buildings required to have an energy monitor, right? Simple measure. If uh, renewable energy, you want that to happen, think about permitting, uh, power purchase agreements, um, trying to get uh, both households and businesses to move to electric boilers and stove away from, from gas. Um, again, the, um, getting um, incentives for um, electric vehicles and encouraging people to go on public transport, and of course, in, with the just transition element, many companies support it, factor in the positioning of those policies with the cost of living, decent work, uh, focusing on households and SMEs. The moment you use those wording, that's something that businesses can understand and contribute to. So paint the future, give them a vision, rather than making them, um, you know, paint a negative story that they need to help solve. Give them a vision, not a problem. Um, set the policies right and uh, partner with them to see where you can leverage from each other. Businesses need governments, governments need businesses, and only then can we create a society that is, works. It's not just public-private partnerships, but it's people-public-private partnerships. We need all three to make this happen. So. Yeah. All right, so... <laughs> And can I ask, that, I mean, one of the things that w when I was back in the day, when I was back in the European Parliament and with the, the Employment Committee, whenever we had um, hearings, for example, in the Parliament, and we would have to have what the European Union calls social partners, um, you, you know, UK tends to talk about two sides. You already see a difference in language. There's the um, usual suspects that you get from the business side. What would be the way to strengthen the voice of those progressive businesses that actually, you know, recognize that their own workers are interested in cleaner environment, better production, better working conditions? How, how can, you know, are there things that we can actually do to help shift that business lobby so that the dominant voice is actually the progressive rather than the ones that never seem to want to change? Yes, again, I'll try and give three uh, specific uh, examples. 
Uh, the first one is around um, what do you what what do you expect businesses to contribute to? Right. So if you make if you paint a picture and you're asking companies, can you help us create those jobs that we need in the future? Can you help us transition to what examples do you have and what do you need from policy? You give them the floor to come forward with those voices. So rather, so you're giving the floor to the progressive voices rather than trying to battle the one who resisted. Um, specifically, I want to give an example on um, on jobs. Right. So. Um, you talk about green jobs, but many people don't know what that means. Yeah? If you talk about what I call star jobs, it's a new economy. We have a North Star of social and a green economy. A star job for me would mean a job that's still there in the future. We're always going to need accountants, for example, that's still there. Whereas maybe a bank clerk is going to disappear because of digitalization. You move to two stars, and those are people that are also able to contribute in a positive way to society. A nurse, for me, is a star job. But if I hear green job, I, if I'm a nurse, I don't feel part of your narrative. Yeah? But for me, those people are really important. And uh, a third level is then three stars, is those people who are in jobs that contribute not only in a, in a social way, but also are building that, that new economy. An electrician who helps build the infrastructure for solar panels or for electric vehicles, you know, they're really contributing. And if you change the narrative about we want jobs that add value to society, and then you ask business, can you explain to us how you're contributing to those star one, star two, star three jobs? All of a sudden businesses are going to look for opportunities to explain that they are contributing to the jobs you want. And think about the psychological um, impact that will have on people who work. All of a sudden, I'm a garbage collector, but I'm actually getting, having a three-star job. Why? Because I collect garbage for recycling for a circular economy, whereas maybe uh, the, the CEO of a bank is a one-star job. It's still around, but it's not the ones that, that society values most. And by doing so, you help business understand how they can contribute, but also you allow the people in society to see themselves as being valuable. Instead of calling them vulnerable, uh, marginalized, I don't want to be mar called marginalized or vulnerable. I don't associate myself with the agenda. I want perspective. And if you make me a star, I'm going to vote for you. And if businesses can help you create those star jobs, then I see this partnership going. So I, I really think Everything you, you're saying is really good, but I would so much like it to position it as a, um, a positive, visionary thing and, and make it very specific where businesses can contribute to. And there are so many examples of businesses who are already trying this, but they need a bigger platform, and you can give that to them. Okay, so we, we need to change, as Greens, we need to be changing our language. I mean, this is something I think other speakers have said as well. So that, you know, we are using a language that actually includes people rather than has people sitting there going, I don't know what you mean. Yeah. Um, and there was a, an interesting example we had. We were doing some work, um, again, in the parliament on plastic recycling. And EU was funding very, very little of that. Maybe it does more now. And there was a particular project where they were working with people who'd been unemployed for a long time, who were then being asked to work with industrial, uh, with picking up plastic in the street. And when they said to people exactly this, this is really socially useful, you stop the drains being blocked, you help wildlife, it's a really positive social thing you're doing, People then were turning up for work because this wasn't... So, okay, so we need to learn from these examples. Um, to, to, the, the umbrella analogy is that, yes, people need an umbrella, but they want to hold the umbrella. I want to hold my own umbrella. I don't want you to hold it for me. G give me the dignity and the opportunity. Give me perspective and make me feel um, proud of what I do and in control of my own future, but you need to help me give perspective. So give the ownership there, and, and then, then people will feel en energized. If I compare the populists to, to, to the Greens, then the populists, I totally disagree with, with what they're saying, but they're giving people a sense of dignity yeah, and pride, and that's exactly what the Greens need to provide too. Give people dignity and pride and ownership of that future. If you're able to nail that, your 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 mission will be accomplished. I'm so confident of that. 
Um, maybe if I could just ask one more uh, quick question. I'm, I've suddenly become aware of the time. I've got really interested in listening to everybody. But in previous EGP councils where we've talked about just transition, the question of trust was raised about not only for workers in a company being asked to develop new ways of working or retrain because, you know, they're working in the coal industry and we want to phase that out. But, you know, people were sort of being asked to, to trust companies that really want to make big changes. Do you think that there are other ways that, you know, how can companies engender trust, maybe with their own workforce, but maybe also with politicians like us that sometimes look at big companies as the enemy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I can totally relate to that. Um, one, no company is perfect, right? Even every single company we work with, if you start digging and you look on, for example, Influence Map, you'll find the imperfections. Just like many of you are probably taking the lift to, the, to, your, to your room instead of taking the stairs, right? <laughs> so um, the, way of, the way of looking at trust is that um, many companies that are trying to do the right thing are asking us the same. How can we make sure that we get, don't get put in the greenwashing box because some other companies are. And the only way to achieve that is with disclosure. And right now there is a, a new standard, so you have like an international finan financing standard, but there's now a, a new board set up, the ISSB, which looks at sustainability disclosure, right? And if the ISSB standard gets accepted, you will have a global baseline that requires companies to disclose how they're dealing with climate issues. Yeah, it can be how they got their governance, their strategy, um, how they're looking at the workers, what actions they're taking, etc. In Europe, we have the Europe Financial Reporting Advisory Group. Now, if ISSB is the baseline, EFRAC goes here, right? In Europe, you have already a standard that is so close aligned with, with science-based targets and 1.5 scenario that I would say for, um, for the um, EU policymakers to mandate disclosure by companies at least to the baseline and then see how far you can raise that bar within Europe because companies that operate internationally they often use Europe as the, as the benchmark, right? If they're going to have to disclose at the European level, not at this level, but at this level, yeah, then I might as well work it out how we do it in the rest of the world. So you're, you're, you have the absolute opportunity to see how can you align behind the global ISSB baseline and how can you then raise ambition for disclosure. And then the moment that disclosure is happening, let other groups, all the NGOs you work with, scrutinize companies on where they're good and, and applaud them there and expose them where they're not. But I would, I would do it that way rather than um, trying to set up separate mechanisms again because this is a, yeah, it, it, is, it is, companies are looking for level playing field, one global standard and not um, a, a myriad of many uh, requirements for that. It's not the only way to gain trust, but it is definitely one way that I think will, will allow um, the companies that are trying to distinguish themselves from the companies that are sort of, you know, piggybacking on that wave and, and you know, sometimes not being consistent because they're backstabbing via the trade associations or other ways. And so allow companies that are trying to do the good things to distinguish themselves. And the way to do it is disclosure. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, thank you. Let's move to Caspers. And um, in a very different situation here, election coming up. Please, good results. Um, but, I mean, when we're talking about all of this on just transition and so on and so forth, I mean, I suppose there are some people who would say, look, Latvia is a small country, you know? We, we don't... It doesn't actually contribute much to climate change, emissions, whatever. So why, why is just transition necessary here? You know, you're not, you're not part of the problem, are you? <laughs> In certain respects, Latvia has been part of the problem. Uh, we have been, uh, you know, we have had three 
very important and long-lasting addictions to the Latvian economy. One addiction that has kind of trickled away over the past couple of years was Latvia's addiction on um, offshoring eastern capital. So Latvia was one of the financial centers uh, for the eastern cash flows. Uh, the other one, the obvious one, was uh, dependency on Russian fossil fuels. And the third one, which is closely related to the first and the second, uh, was a long-standing uh, addiction and specialization in transshipment of Russian uh, raw materials. Low value add resources, uh, including coal to Germany, including oil and oil materials. So in many ways, Latvia has been part of both the value chain and the supply chain that has been at the center of um, kind of perpetuating this energy dependency. And that's why uh, one of the key platforms on which the progressives which I firmly believe, also believe, at the core of the European Green Movement, and I hope that our dynamic team uh, proved that uh, in the presentation today. Well, one of the platforms that we are bringing to Latvia is the Latvian Green Deal, and we are modeling it on, on Aristotle's four natural elements. So Latvia already has uh, plenty of water, so the uh, Daugava River that all of you crossed on your way from the airport uh, has a uh, hydropower cascade, so that's uh, definitely our most important backbone of uh, electricity-based generation. But clearly it's very, very uh, seasonal with fluctuations. So the second element is air, as in uh, wind energy, and that obviously has synergies uh, with electrolyzers, hydrogen generation, with potential applications in the mobility industry. Then we have fire, as in solar power, and obviously all these uh, should be uh, interconnected. And the fourth element, the earth, uh, Latvia is covered, half of its uh, territory is covered by forests. So obviously we have a lot of wood, uh, a lot of wood biomass, which unfortunately gets exported as a raw material uh, to a very large extent, but should certainly be used in a more circular fashion uh, here in Latvia uh, for both uh, energy and district heating uh, generation. And on top of these four elements, uh, of course, we are also promoting a very comprehensive uh, energy efficiency uh, program. Uh, built around energy insulation, heating insulation at homes, and hopefully one that also uh, takes advantage of uh, materials created here in Latvia. Again, contributing uh, to a more sustainable circular economy and, and creating these longer term sustainable jobs. Okay, and, and what do you think, I mean, uh, are going to be the social benefits of this just transition? You've mentioned the, presumably it would be a three star job, would it? Yes. Okay, a three-star job. There's longer-lasting jobs um, in, in certain parts of the energy sector. What are the other social benefits that, that your program... I'm, I'm amazed, you, you know, we're looking at Aristotle as the basis for a program. Um, much more sensible than my Prime Minister's references to Greek stuff. But, um, <laughs> you, you know, so how, how is this going to benefit people in their every, everyday lives? Well, let me, let me broader the, the, scale, the scale here. Uh, another platform that we are running, uh, as opposed to some of the other parties, is that we want to unify the society, unify the different, very fragmented groups in the Latvian society. And here it ranges from Latvians and non-Latvians, uh, for the haves and the have-nots, the rich and the poor. Latvia has a very high level of, of income and wealth uh, inequality. It, is, it also has to do with uh, the healthy and the less healthy, the educated and the less educated, the able-bodied and people with disabilities. And unfortunately, we have an imperfect infrastructure which lock some groups of people outside of, of, of their uh, personal autonomy. So in our understanding, and clearly uh, we strongly advocate, and I think the last uh, years of, of, of the tragic COVID years have shown the possibilities for, for Europe uh, to stimulate the economy. I mean, as the issuer of one of uh, global reserve currencies, Europe as a whole doesn't have uh, a spending limit, an arbitrary spending limit. It doesn't have to tax to be able to spend. And I think this, uh, this uh, preceding crisis uh, has, has shown that, and it also has revealed the deficiencies in infrastructure. In Latvia, 
uh, one of the reasons why Latvia unfortunately had some of the highest uh, rates, death rates uh, from, from COVID is that it exposed many, many years, in fact decades, of underinvestment in the health, uh, health system. And we also have deficiencies in, in, in uh, education system that need to be addressed in transport and digital connectivity. One of the major examples, a pan-European flagship initiative, Rail Baltic, a high-speed economic corridor is being put in place here, which will, of course, also address uh, issues of uh, creating long-term jobs, creating a more sustainable mode of, of mobility and logistics, uh, at the same time also creating uh, the platform for autonomy also for people uh, with, uh, with disabilities. So in, so in that sense, uh, our social package towards the election is closely intertwined with our industrial policy. And we believe that uh, you know, nations have to be actively developed or states and societies and economies. They should not simply be left to, to some market forces which, which very quickly and promptly get, uh, get captured by, by different rentier interests. And that's what we want to change here. We want to have a very progressive uh, industrial policy built around the sustainable areas uh, where, of course, uh, the state, if you will, the entrepreneurial state, uh, as Mariana Matsukato would put it, should be the catalyst uh, and also bring together uh, sustainable private businesses, the people, and all of that will, of course, bring also major uh, social benefits and alleviate some of the uh, fragments in the Latvian society and, for, the, for that nature, also contribute to more unified uh, society in Europe. And do people tell you, well, this all sounds very wonderful, um, but where's the money coming from and what's this going to do for my taxes? Or, you know, do you have an answer about, well, yes, the cash is there, we just need to make sure it's spent for people's benefits? Well, we're looking, this, is, this is a multi-dimensional issue, of course. Uh, it's not just about tax proceeds. Uh, clearly, there need to be accents need to be changed in the Latvian tax policy. And this is something that echoes over the past two years here, uh, over the past two days here, but also over the years, uh, is that, of course, we need to shift the tax focus away from labor, more onto ca capital, especially onto idle capital. And in Latvia, of course, there's a lot of idle uh, land, a lot of idle property. And, um, well, as an economist, I firmly believe that the land value taxation is, is a wonderful source of non-distortionary uh, taxation, not just to create a more, well, not just to create the source of revenue uh, in order to be channeled into more sustainable investments, uh, but also in a more, results in a more territorially balanced, more fair uh, allocation of, of, of capital uh, in, in the society. So that's one source of, of, of revenue. Then uh, we are advocating for the creation or actually uh, the augmentation of an existing uh, financial institution into a full-fledged national development bank. We are actually looking at KFV, the driving force behind the, the Energiewende, uh, that you can see that you can have a smart, sustainable uh, financial institution, a transformation bank, uh, you know, providing the necessary capital uh, with very high credit ratings, with green bonds, uh, in order to finance the, the necessary investments. There's also a very significant element of uh, shadow economy in, in Latvia. In some ways, this is the consequence of the wrong accents in the taxation policy. So in some ways, it's, it's a symptom rather than the cause of, of, of this economic problem. But clearly, by fine-tuning the, uh, the tax policy, it is possible to generate more revenues uh, for the government in order to be channeled into these uh, long-term sustainable uh, social investments. Okay, well, it sounds a good program to me. I think, yeah, I'd vote for that. <laughs> and I think if we're into sort of taxation and economy, that sounds like um, your area, Ernest. So I'm sure Vula has a few questions. Absolutely, I think that now uh, we are coming uh, to, to some questions which uh, are very much related to Europe. I uh, have been member of the European Parliament from uh, 2014. I mean, in the mid-time you arrived when we, are st we were still in the economic crisis and the financial crisis of 2009. And via this multiple crisis, 
uh, uh, we would like to understand from you what are the dynamics in the European Parliament. Do you really see um, <coughs> how close the institutions generally are, are towards this uh, Green Deal, green just transition? What, what is your evaluation and what we have achieved as a group in the European Parliament the last, uh, the last years, Ernest? Okay, well, thank you so much and, and, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, well, I, I think we need to be aware that uh, I think that the, the transition and the needs for decarbonize our economy uh, come at a moment in Europe uh, where we have still extremely deep social wounds coming from the, the previous financial crisis. That, that we, we need really to be aware. We, we are imposing a, a very fast transition in societies that are extreme, uh, extremely socially hurt. Um, I think that the EU reacted much better uh, during the, the pandemic. I think that we have to acknowledge that. I think that there is some lessons learned from uh, what, what was done wrong. And I think indeed that, uh, like we call in Spain, I think that during the pandemic, the EU allowed for member states, but also the EU itself, to deploy a kind of social shield to protect the most vulnerable during the pandemic. I think that was done, we can fairly say that, and, and, and there have been some improvements uh, which, had, which should be noted. Huh? In this second mandate, because this is my second mandate in the European Parliament, I see a much more dynamism when it comes to social policies than what I saw in the previous mandate. I mean, we have, uh, I mean, not only when it comes to gender equality, but also we have uh, initiatives like a directive for minimum wages. We will establish a directive for minimum income. Uh, we are, I don't know, just negotiating now the pay transparency directive to fight gender pay gap. So I, I think there is a will at EU level to really deploy um, a social agenda. And on the other hand, I think when it comes to the economic policy mix, the EU also learned the lesson during the pandemic in two ways. Firstly, by allowing member states to, to, to really put the money in the economy that was needed, but on the other hand, by the historical achievement of the recovery fund, which I think we can all be very, very, very happy and proud because that is really a, a momentum for the EU. But now I think we are in a difficult moment. We also need to realize that for, for, for several issues. Firstly, I think we have all to be aware that the Green Deal is under attack, politically under attack because of the war. I mean, there are forces in the European Parliament who really would like to suspend the legislative agenda and the policies of the, good, of the Green Deal. And, and I can, can explain you, for instance, when we negotiated the last resolutions on the economic consequences of the war, there were political groups in the Parliament who came with amendments calling for a full moratorium, legislative moratorium on the Green Deal because of the war which is totally nonsense because we know, as Ricardo has very well explained, that in some areas, and in, in energy, for instance, we need to accelerate rather than, than, uh, than, um, than not to stop what, what is being done. But, but, but this is really a reality. And the second thing which worries me a lot is also that inflation is bringing back debates when it comes to the economy uh, that, um, that, that, that worries me a bit. And I will, I will put you a, a couple of examples. Firstly, I think that uh, the whole issue of inflation uh, is bringing monetary policy debates back into, an, into uh, areas where I think it can be very, very dangerous for the coming years when it comes to the capacity of member states to boost investment. And secondly, uh, the second big debate we will have when it comes to our economic policy mix in the, in the coming months is what is going on, what, what will happen with the fiscal rules at your level. And those two issues are going to be extremely important. And uh, because Let's be very clear. If because of inflation, because of a half indebtment, we go to a more restrictive monetary policy and we impose a new round of austerity policy to member states in the coming years when the rules will kick in, I mean, we can't forget about the Green Deal. There will not be a Green Deal if we go back to the old, to the old, uh, to the old recipes. And I'm afraid, Vula, that the, in, in the Parliament, not only we have this trend to, 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 to phase the Green Deal or to block it, but also to come back to failed economic policies because of the dynamics that we're seeing. So really here we have a challenge as, uh, as Greens to really show that the two things go hand in hand, that not only we need to accelerate the Green Deal, but on the other hand, that we need to continue fighting for a full transformation of the economic policy mix so that the good lessons that we learned during the pandemic can be a European really political and economic agenda for, for the medium and long term. This morning, uh, the Commissioner, but also in other panels, uh, it was raised the question of taxation mm -hmm. uh, as an instrument in order to promote uh, the ecological, but also a just transition. 
And uh, of course, we have worked quite a lot of, uh, we have a lot of ideas on that. But of course, every time that we, we use the word taxation, people get scared because they say, oh, who pays and who should pay? So could you develop a little bit uh, more on this, on this part of such, such an important instrument that he had, it has been somehow forgotten also because of unanimities and all the rest? So, if, uh, if you can develop a little bit, I will... Uh, no, no, and, and, and I think that this issue is at the core of uh, what we are discussing of the just transition. Um, and uh, I'll take the most um, relevant example that, 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 um, that everybody is discussing lately, which, which is the high energy prices. I mean, we will really be in a, in a problem if people have the feeling when we come to the ecological transition that they are paying higher energy bills, but on the other hand, they are big multinational making huge profits and nothing is done about it. I mean, this is the best way to make the, the transition fail. If it's really perceived by the people of not being fair, we were talking trust before. No. This is the most quick way of, 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 of breaking trust of people in the transition. That's why one of the things that the group has been uh, uh, most, uh, most calling, and, and our colleague Rasmus Andersen from the German uh, Greens uh, has been very active on that, that we really need a framework to tax those windfall profits. I mean, but this is really a debate that we need. We, we, it's not one. I mean, well, the Commission has been proposing member states uh, to, 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 to do that, but we still have, uh, in several jurisdictions, nothing is done about that. And really, this is really at the core of the debate of the just transition. But more broadly, uh, I wanted to start by this concrete example to make a more broad uh, reflection about the need to rethink uh, how the distribution of, of, of wealth uh, in the EU. I think one of the key elements for the just transition really to be successful is that we really built a new social contract ba based on a better redistribution of wealth. Not only that, of course, we need better employment policies, we need better social protection systems, but a better redistribution of wealth is really part of that. And an advanced and an ambitious uh, uh, taxation program for the EU is really important. And there, we have several projects that uh, are a bit stuck, and you probably have heard that the, the project of having a, a, a directive for minimum taxation of multinationals have been stuck in council now for too many months because of Poland blocking it. It's, it, it was a huge achievement at the, o, uh, at the OCDE uh, uh, during the last uh, years. But for instance, the idea of arm, harmonizing the corporate base on the which you, you tax multinationals is a project blocked in the council, uh, or the very famous uh, 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 transaction tax that we have been advocating in the, in the parliament for so many years, it's still not a reality. So, indeed, we absolutely need to push for that. I'm very proudly, I can very proudly say that the Greens are really a driving force for fair taxation at, in all member states, but also at EU level. And then maybe I come to your point, and then maybe I, I, I will end it here, of the issue of unanimity. We really have a problem in order to advance that agenda to break the unanimity in the Council when it comes to taxation. So now, well, it's not the topic for, uh, for the discussion uh, uh, this afternoon, but now that we are discussing the possibility of reopening the debate on the treaties, thanks to the Conference on Europe, because the Parliament is really working on that, really mainly focusing on breaking unanimity in, so in a key area such as taxation, I think it's going to be a really, really important element. Ricarda, back to you, because after all this discussion and uh, points and, uh, and positions, you can imagine how big is your responsibility from the strongest economically country in the European Union, but also where we are present uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the government. Um, so, um, my question, because I don't think we will have so much time to come back on, uh, on the other issues I know, but that I cannot not ask it, <laughs> is the issue of um, how do you think that Germany and you in the government can help in the coming months in this point if, on, around the question of the Future for Europe debate uh, to uh, make Europe more sustainable and more able uh, to, uh, uh, to, to face the current challenges and promote our, our vision. 
Well, I think one thing that was really, really important for us when we entered government, and I think that our leaders that are part of the government, Annalena Baerbock, Robert Habeck, they're also showing this, is that with everything we do, we don't do it in politicians who think in a national framework, but we always do it as Europeans and also as European Greens entering this government. And what that means, and I can tell you, this is not easy because we are part of a coalition where we have especially one partner with the liberals who are leaning towards austerity politics, who are leaning towards politics who, when it becomes hard, you look back on the national level, who, when it becomes hard, you decrease your spending, who, when it becomes hard, you decrease European solidarity. So this will be a fight for us within the government. But I think we as a Green Party are really, really clear. We said we wanted to change the role of Germany within the European Union. Because in the last years, not only has it been a driving force for austerity after the financial crisis, it has always been, or not always, but in many cases also been a blocking country, a country that when there was a chance for progress within the European Parliament and within the European Union, Germany has been one that put up a stop sign and it was like, well, no, we can't do this, we can't do that, we can't do that. And therefore, we have been preventing a lot of progress. And I think one, and Janest has talked about it, one issue where, which is also why I'm fighting so hard for this, because for me, it's a question of justice, but also one issue is the windfall profit tax, because now the European Parliament is putting it forward. Many countries in Europe are showing that it's working and our finance minister is like, well, there can't be no way how this can work. And I'm like, well, I don't think your ministry is so much worse at that job than the one in Italy or the one on other European levels, so you can do it. But actually, this will be a question where we can really show, and I'm working on that, that Germany is no longer blocking progress on a European level, but we should be pushing forward for it. We should show how it is working, we should show how it can be done, and we should show, and then I'm also coming back to many things you said, how it's done with European solidarity. Because we know that the financial crisis is hitting us, the inflation hitting us, it's hitting Germany very hard. But of course it's hitting those countries that have never recovered from the last financial crisis even harder. So I think responsibility for a German government has to mean to think European, to act European and also to act on European solidarity le level. And maybe one last sentence because I think what we really have seen when we talk about just transition, there's so many different aspects and I would like to talk about 20 more of them. But what we really need to show, and I think we need to show it as Germany within Europe, but then as Europe as a whole, that if we do this transition, and on the core of this transition is exiting fossil fuels, this is really like the core issue for many, many things we have been talking about. We will, on the one hand, save our environment, we will make our future more just, but we're also doing something for our democracies. Not just because of right-wing populists, but also we have been seeing that fossil fuels always have a tendency towards monopoles. We see this in Russia, but we see it in many other countries. And those monopoles are economically, but they're also politically. And wind and sun, it sounds really basic, but they don't belong to anybody. So if we get independent of fossil fuels, we also get independent of dictators, we get independent of authoritarian regimes. So if we want to better the European democracy, and I think we have talked about many steps to do this, we need to get rid of fossil fuels. With that, we will protect our environment, our social security, but also our democracies. We are due to finish at six. I, so. <laughs> I just remind my, my co-chair there. So I think that maybe we, you know, on the stirring words, we, we should take that with us. And I think that what we can take also from our panelists this afternoon, apart from the real range, the expertise and the passion that they bring to us, is also some learning about the language that we use, reframing the ideas that we have, so that there, people can connect with it and feel that they are, they are part of this change and that the change matters, that it gives dignity, that it gives a real sense of, of purpose now, not just for the future, and that it does answer people's 
pe people's needs. Um, you, you know, however we're, we're framing that. The part of that is through greater partnership. And really that partnership being a real partnership, not just one being a vehicle for the other, but actually working together. And I would add that if we're looking at that internationally, there is a whole thing here that really frames this in terms of global power. Because what we're talking about here as well with the fossil industry and others, it's extractive. And it's an old neo-colonial, you know, sort of model that we also need to be breaking free from that gives not only us independence, but actually shifts power um, within, within the world. That obviously the questions around inequality and redistribution are very close and dear to our hearts, whether that's through better wages, better benefits, better jobs, reducing prices, giving people more, making society more inclusive. And that the issues about trust, there are ways in which we can work with that in the different sorts of democracy that we use, not just at election time, but in transparency as well, in the engagement. And that, you know, apparently we, we do have some good ideas that actually do affect people's lives, may, do answer some of those immediate needs as well as that vision for the future that people feel they can be part of. We find, need to find a way of expressing that better and in a more inclusive way as well so that you know, we can learn from everything that we have been hearing this afternoon. So thank you so much to our panelists for everything that you have brought us. Thank you. So, should... Thank you. Thank you, our dear moderators and uh, impressive panelists for this powerful closing of today's um, plenary session. I think uh, you gave us all very important uh, takeaways. Um, I also wanted to thank you all on and off the stage, as well as uh, our online viewers for your attention and your dedication and contribution to these sessions. Uh, with this, I bid goodbye to our online viewers, and I have a few announcements left to make for those that are here uh, in Riga. But before I do that, I just wanted to take a personal parenthesis and say goodbye to you after these two days in the plenary because I will not be with you tomorrow. Uh, you will have the wonderful app with you, so I don't think I will be largely missed tomorrow. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to say that uh, these have been very rich two days for me, and it was an unusual role for me to take up. Uh, this is not something I do professionally. Um, so I wanted to thank Progressivi and the EGP Brussels team for this opportunity. <laughs> And I wanted to also thank all of you for the work uh, that you're doing, because after these two days, I personally, I feel uh, very reassured about the future of Europe, which is very important to me. And there was a lot of talk about family, and with the risk of sounding uh, cheesy now, I wanted to also say that I feel reassured uh, to return home after two days of absence. We go to my three kids, and, well, my husband, he'll forgive me, <laughs> because I know that I can be reassured telling my 80-year-old son, uh, who loves fish, that there are people whose mission is to protect and take care of the fish. I can tell, I feel reassured because I can tell my uh, beautiful and strong-willed uh, six-year-old daughter that there are these warrior goddesses out here that are, you know, dismantling all the glass ceilings and the glass walls so that she could dream and do whatever she wants to without having to take care of that. And I can... <laughs> um, I can... Uh, I can tell my wonderful uh, mother uh, here in the Latvian countryside that there are people whose mission is to make sure that she doesn't have to worry for paying the heating bills now that the winter is approaching with her pension that is 300 euro after a life uh, of uh, work and raising five children. And I can tell my father, a former judge, that there are people whose mission is actually to have a principled stance on rule of law. 
And last, I ha can also feel reassured to return home and talk to my Ukrainian displaced neighbors that they are people whose mission is to have a strong position and not compromise with bullies and criminals that disrupt lives and peace uh, in Europe. So thank you all of, uh, thanks to all of you for this opportunity to be here and get this reassurance. Uh, And those that are gathered here in Riga, I still have a few practical announcements for tonight. So don't uh, miss, there are still a few uh, events. Uh, now from 6 until 7, you can meet the EGP networks. Uh, there you can get a first-hand uh, insight into their daily actions and also see ways how you can get engaged. There are uh, quite a few of them, the Mediterranean Network, Balkan Network, Disability Network and uh, the Network of Green Seniors and Gender and Queer Network. You can meet them outside and uh, talk and uh, see how you can contribute. And at 7, everybody together will be leaving this hotel uh, for a street action, uh, which will be dedicated to the question of housing, and it's organized by protest, so the youth wing of Progressive, I'm a great fan of them, and by Tilt. Uh, so this action will take place in front of the Cabinet of Ministers, just, just next door, together with Progressive representatives in the City Council. And there will be a group picture. Do not forget to bring your party flags. And then, brace yourselves, <laughs> there will be a whole night to discover also the hip corners of Riga. There will be dinner, a DJ, a raffle and whatnot uh, from 8.30 at the Tallinn ELS Quartals. So this is a former industrial zone that has turned into an area hosting uh, concerts, artists, bars and workshops. And to get in there and to have dinner, actually, do not forget to bring the bracelet uh, that was included in your um, badge. Um, otherwise, you might have difficulty uh, getting access to food. And as you party, <laughs> do not uh, forget that there is a still a working day, a day three tomorrow. It will start at nine with work on the final texts, on membership relations, on financial reporting. Then the voting session will follow at 11, and uh, the council will end with closing remarks at 1 o'clock. So, thank you all again. Enjoy Riga tonight, and make Riga green again. <laughs> uh, enjoy, and all the best for your working sessions tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>